Here we have a rotating sphere of water about 25 millimeters in diameter and inside this sphere are a whole bunch of little tiny air bubbles. And we will see what the angular acceleration due to rotation does to these air bubbles as a function of time. What you are observing are the bubbles moving to the center axis of rotation. As a function of time they will form this rather tightly packed uh, bubble core. 
these bubbles are kept from coalescing from a small amount of added surfactant to the water. Here we have a rotating sphere filled with bubbles and tea leaves and as expected the bubbles go to the center and the tea leaves go to the outside edge along with a few chunks of orange peel. Here we have a rotating sphere with bubbles and chunks from breaking up a small vitamin tablet and the bubbles go to the center core but the vitamin chunks seem to stay in their location dispersed through the sphere and from this we deduced that the vitamin chunks have a density near that of water. Let me tell you how I first became interested in the hollow earth theory. Back in the 1970s, two scientists from the Soviet Academy of Sciences proposed a theory that the moon might be hollow. An American author by the name of Don Wilson then wrote a book based on this idea. It was called Our Mysterious Spaceship Moon. One of the more interesting things mentioned in that book was the Apollo 12 seismic experiment. Apollo 12 placed the first seismometer on an alien world. NASA did not expect many moonquakes. They expected the moon to be seismically dead. To ensure some kind of seismic results, they deliberately crashed part of a rocket into the moon. When they did this, the results astounded them. The moon's behavior was quite unexpected. It rang like a bell for almost an hour. Quotes from the scientists of the time are quite interesting. Science News in its 1970 yearbook went on to suggest that maybe the moon is hollow. It stated the following. During the first day or two after the event, many researchers were reluctant even to try to devise a lunar model that would fit the strange phenomenon. Some such models would have made for a rather bizarre moon, such as a hollow titanium ball, said Captain Shearer, which is highly unlikely. Two Russian scientists then wrote a paper entitled, Is the Moon the Creation of Intelligence? It was published in the Russian journal Sputnik. They suggested the moon had been created by aliens and put into orbit around the Earth. I never forgot the hollow moon theory. It made me open to the idea that the Earth or other planets might also be hollow. My interest in the hollow Earth theory only began in the early 1990s when internet came to South Africa and I started discussing the idea with Americans. I then learned of another book, this time by an American named Marshall Gardner. He revived the hollow earth idea in 1913. He wasn't a scientist. Instead, he seemed to be something of an inventor and perhaps even an engineer. He wrote a book entitled a journey to the Earth's interior. 
Marshall Gardner wrote a great deal about the Arctic regions and the idea that there was a gigantic hole covering all of the Arctic which led into the Earth's interior. He tried to show that hot air came from the north instead of cold air. He also cited evidence of animals which traveled north for winter instead of south. I am by profession a software developer and an IT consultant. I have been in IT for over 20 years. There is nothing which tests one's own logic as much as a computer. The slightest oversight on your part can cause serious problems. One thing which computers taught me was that small things can have big ramifications. As I thought about the hollow earth idea, it became apparent to me that the slightest oversight by scientists could have a radical effect upon their ideas about the inner earth. Many books have been written about the hollow earth and the vast majority of them are rubbish. I realized that nobody had applied serious thought to the subject since Marshall Gardner. IT often borrows on ideas and concepts used by engineers. One of these concepts is a feasibility study. I decided to do my own feasibility study on the hollow planet idea to see if it had any merits. My approach was the following. I knew there were many uncomfortable scientific facts which did not fit current theories properly. I wondered if some of these facts could be related to the hollow earth theory. So I set out to find all the facts I could which did not fit current theories and to see which, if any, could be tied back to the hollow earth theory. I wanted to see if the hollow earth theory could explain some things better than the solid earth theory. The father of the hollow earth theory is none other than Sir Edmund Halley. He was one of the greatest astronomers and scientists of his time. He discovered Halley's Comet. He was the first man to propose that the Earth might be hollow. He studied the motion of the Earth's magnetic field. In those days, they did not know much about magnetism. He suggested that maybe there were some magnetized objects moving around inside the Earth which were causing the Earth's magnetic field to move. He came up with the theory of concentric spheres. He imagined there were several spheres inside the Earth and each of these was magnetized. He thought they were rotating at different speeds, thereby causing the Earth's magnetic field to move. When there was a great aurora in England, he suggested that it was caused by a luminous atmosphere which was inside the earth and which was leaking out. He suggested that there was a great hole in the Arctic that led into the interior of the earth. The hollow earth theory has survived for centuries, egged on by odd people. It is said that Leonard Euler the greatest mathematician of all time, also became interested in the idea. He supposedly did not think the idea of several spheres was practical. So he simplified it into a single shell with a large cavity inside it. Euler was a prolific writer and most of his texts are in Russia. A great deal of his writings have never been translated into English. Sadly, I could not find any of his writings on the hollow earth, even though there are rumors that he played a major role in the development of the idea. Many works of fiction have been written about the hollow earth. The most famous of them is Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. Scientists are convinced planets cannot be hollow. This is because of the theory of gravity. In astronomy, the masses of all the planets are relative. So astronomers will tell you that planets are not hollow 
because when they compare the mass of one planet to another, they find them to have a pretty similar density. Because scientists are convinced the Earth itself is hollow, sorry, because, this, because scientists are convinced the Earth is solid, they then reach the conclusion that all the planets must be solid. However, if the Earth were hollow, then it would follow that all the planets are hollow. That is an important realization which I came to, that either all the planets are solid or all are hollow. If some were solid and others were hollow, then astronomers would have noticed this a long time ago. You might wonder how come they are convinced the Earth is solid. This comes from the Cavendish balance experiment. The Cavendish balance is a device that measures the attraction between two lead balls. Scientists then take these results and extrapolate them to find the mass of the Earth. This gives them a mass of 6,6 .6 trillion tons. Take note that this is the one and only method we have of estimating the Earth's mass. There is no method of cross-checking these results. The problem with the Cavendish balance experiment is that it is based on a number of assumptions. The lead balls, for example, are electrically neutral. If there is any difference between the planets and those lead balls, then the results of the experiment will be meaningless. For example, if the Earth, for example, the Earth contains electrical currents inside of it up to one billion amps. If electricity were to affect the way gravity works, then it would nullify the results of the Cavendish balance experiment. Consider too that in nature static electricity has an attractive force which is incredibly strong compared to gravity. It is assumed that planets are electrically neutral and that static electricity is not a factor to be considered. If any of these assumptions are invalid, then the Cavendish experiment is worthless. In my book, I discuss a great many issues relating to gravity, which we will not go into now. But gravity is not as cut and dried as you may think. There are a great many technical issues to do with gravity that have yet to be solved. Dr. Tom Van Flanden, a professional astronomer in the USA, pointed out that even such things as the speed of gravity are unknown. There is no atomic level theory of gravity which works. We have hardly advanced our knowledge of gravity since Newton's time. One thing I discovered in my feasibility study was that a scientist in the 1960s, Dr. Saxel, mentioned he had a discussion with Albert Einstein. Einstein told him he was convinced that electricity and gravity are interrelated. Dr. Saxel went on to do a number of experiments with electrically charged pendulums to see if Einstein's ideas were correct. He got some very strange results with his electrical pendulums. Nowadays, Scientists deny the possibility that electricity may affect gravity. However, if it does, then their estimates of the mass of the Earth will be completely wrong. We know there are electrical currents inside the Earth. Calculations based on the Earth's magnetic field show that deep inside the Earth, there must be electrical currents of up to one billion amps. If these currents affect gravity, then the Earth may weigh much more or much less than the Cavendish balance experiment shows. People hear about the hollow Earth theory. The first question they ask me is where does lava come from? The completely false impression schools have created in everyone's minds is that the Earth is a red hot ball of lava. They then imagine that lava from volcanoes comes from the center of the Earth. 
Ask any geologist or seismologist if this is true, and they will tell you it is not so. Standard geology and seismology texts tell a different story. Scientists know that most lava is slightly radioactive, and they believe it is produced either by decaying radium or through stresses in the crust. Lava is created by, by heat generated within the crust of the earth. The crust of the earth is thought to be no more than 20 miles thick, although, to be honest, nobody has ever actually penetrated the crust, so we do not know what lies beneath it. Scientists will tell you that lava is a crustal phenomenon, and all lava comes from no deeper than 20 miles. If the earth were an ocean of molten lava, then it, would be, then it would actually be subject to tidal pressures and the continents would be broken to pieces as the earth rotated. Scientists say the earth is actually composed of solid rock for the most part. As you go deeper, the pressures are supposed to be so great that the rock actually flows from extreme pressure. But nowhere in modern geology or seismology will you see them saying the earth is a ball of molten lava. In fact, the final proof comes from seismology itself. When an earthquake occurs, seismic waves travel out in all directions throughout all the earth. There are two types of seismic waves, P waves and S waves. Based on this, scientists know that all of the earth is actually quite rigid and composed only of rock. And looked into things to see if I could find evidence of something that's not supposed to be there. For example, I had heard that animals had been seen going north for winter, and I had heard that there were islands that had once been on maps and then taken off. And as I dug into Arctic history, I did find some very strange things. And a lot of them centered around a region in the ocean, north of Canada, more to the northwest of Canada and to the north of Alaska. And it strangely coincides with the region that is where the geomagnetic pole is. And there were lots of mysteries there. There, there were things to do with land that had been mapped. There was even the suggestion of a continent that existed north of Alaska. And as I dug into the Arctic history, there were some tremendous mysteries that I uncovered. And I would like to actually dig more into this. I have even suggested to people, I wish I could hire an airplane or go to certain places and actually conduct certain experiments. For example, there's a place off the northern coast of Canada where you can actually see land which is not supposed to be on a map. And as you saw earlier on in the presentation, um, Dr. Cook had, for example, photographed a place called Bradley Land. And you see that photograph there, but that place, which, and he told us exactly where he was at the time he took the photograph, you will not find that place on any map anywhere. And if you look at the Arctic, the Arctic Sea is actually quite shallow. And a strange feature of the Arctic is that it is for such a large area, it actually has no islands on it whatsoever, even though it is a shallow sea. But take a look at any other ocean on the Earth, and you will see islands there. And so I sometimes wondered if there were things that had just been blotted off the map, and the map made to look as if it's just ocean. There are many other things. For example, um, Admiral Perry, when he was in the north of Greenland, Eskimos told him, that volcanic ash had actually fallen on a part of Greenland. And so Admiral Perry then said that judging from the wind currents, this volcanic ash must come from a volcano somewhere far in the north. But nobody ever found such a volcano. And the most interesting thing I discovered, and this actually only happened after my book had been published, was that there had been an expedition in 1914 to a place called Crocker Land. Now, Crocker Land was marked on maps until the 1920s. The US Navy actually sent a very big expedition to Crocker Land, and 
They couldn't quite reach it, but they did see it. And one of the people on that mission, uh, a Lieutenant Commander Green, actually wrote an article. He, he actually was a scientist as well. And Green actually wrote an article about the possibility that there was a huge continent to the north of Alaska. And this idea had actually been suggested by one of the um, US geodetic scientists. He had said that tides to the north of Alaska were weird in the sense that it was as if there was an object in the ocean to the north of Alaska, which was interfering with the flow of water. And this was backed up later on by sightings of land by people like Dr. Cook, Admiral Perry, etc. There were actually a lot of people who saw land, and those names are all famous names, and it's all written about in Arctic history. But you will find that none of those things, you know, in the end, they just conclude, oh, there's nothing there. And you'll actually find that the Russians had a similar experience on their side of the Arctic. There were islands which they saw and which they mapped, and which they later on then went and took off maps. One of those places was called Sanikov Land. Um, with regard to the holes at the poles, um, I dug into, into ways of trying to prove whether there could be polar holes or not. I could never find a photograph that I believed was genuine. But what I did find was that you could, through other ways, possibly infer the existence of a polar hole. One of the ways was to do with Chernobyl. When, when there was the nuclear accident at Chernobyl, there was low-lying radiation which moved to the north. Now, one thing which I discovered was that in meteorology, all atmospheric currents move away from the equator to the polar regions. And I actually spoke to an American Air Force colonel who used to go and sort of spy on whether the Russians were actually conducting nuclear tests. And the way that they did it was they would send an aircraft up to the North Pole and it would collect air samples. And just by picking up air samples from the North Pole, Americans can tell you if the Russians have exploded a nuclear device above ground or not. And so with the Chernobyl mystery, what happened was after Chernobyl, there were some American scientists who were at the South Pole and they were digging in the snow and they were actually measuring radiation levels. And the snow in Antarctica actually piles up at a very fixed rate. It piles up at one foot per year. And because it's so cold there, the ice does not melt. So what happened was these scientists were digging into the snow and using it like the, the rings on a tree, because by just going deeper and deeper and deeper, you could tell which year the radiation fell. So what happened was they found that at a time that coincided with about two years after Chernobyl, that there was a very sharp jump in radiation at the South Pole. And <clears throat> the radiation from Chernobyl has a very particular isotope that does not occur in nature. And so these scientists were actually very surprised to find that there had been an increase in radiation near the South Pole about two and a half years after Chernobyl. But here's where the mystery came. Scientists know about the flow of air from the equator to the poles. So the way the cycle works is it flows from the equator to the pole, back to the equator, back to the same pole. In other words, the air flow stays in each hemisphere. So air in the northern hemisphere doesn't hardly ever reaches the southern hemisphere. And the scientists had found evidence of nuclear radiation all over the northern hemisphere, but they never found any at the southern hemisphere except at the South Pole. And so that was one of the things I thought could possibly indicate that maybe that air had gone from Chernobyl to the North Pole, gone through the Earth and reached the South Pole. And the interesting thing was this time delay and the scientists discovered that there was a time delay of two and a half years. There was another thing that I also looked into, and that was meteorology. In meteorology, the scientists can only predict weather for a certain time into the future. And all their calculations are, are, 
are finely based. They're done on, on temperatures and pressures that they've measured throughout a hemisphere. And what scientists have discovered is that their calculations, no matter how hard they try, their calculations are only accurate for a certain period of time. It's two or three weeks. And I'm sure many of you will question even that. But um, the only way they got around it was another scientist came along and came up with a thing called chaos theory. And he basically tried to say that maybe it is actually impossible to predict the weather. And he tried to invoke some sort of atomic level um, ideas. Okay? But now the issue is predicting the weather shouldn't be such a big mystery. It should actually be quite simple. If you know the pressures and you have the formula, you should be able to calculate the results. If you can calculate the results for two or three days, there's no reason why you can't calculate it for two or three months or a longer period than that. And the one thing that nobody would ever consider is the possibility that what if the Earth is hollow? What if there is a polar hole? What if there is atmosphere inside the Earth? Because then what would happen is as the seasons change on the outside of the Earth, you would have air moving into the Earth or out of the Earth. And it would be large quantities of air. And any mathematical calculation you have, if you don't take that into account, the, the whole calculation will fall apart over a period of time.
Hello, this is the Music Memory Lane, and welcome to Chapter 3 of my Hollow Earth series. Well, I've thought a lot about how to present my third Hollow Earth video, and I figured the robot voice needed a break. So in this video, I do all the talking. Well, in part 2, I told you about an alleged UFO crash in Freiburg, Germany. Although there is almost no evidence to back this up, I strongly believe something or someone was helping the Germans to become the most advanced nation on this planet during the Second World War. You have to realize that Hitler's inner circle was teeming with individuals that were obsessed with the occult and the paranormal. People like Rudolf Hess and Hitler himself were convinced that a race of superhumans escaped the surface of our planet during a cataclysmic event, perhaps an event that resembled the biblical giant flood. Secret societies like the Thule and Frill Society were absolutely obsessed in obtaining occult artifacts like the Holy Grail, the Ark of the Covenant and the Spear of Destiny. The Spear of Destiny was one of those artifacts they did manage to obtain. It has been said that those who own the Spear of Destiny will become undefeatable. So it's not hard to understand why the Germans were so desperate to find these items. We have to ask ourselves some critical questions. How was Germany able to overcome the hardship of the Versailles Treaty, the inflation, the millions of Reichsmarks they had to pay to France and England after losing the First World War, a nation in complete rubble, and in a matter of years Germany had become one of the most leading nations in the world. How was that possible? And whatever answer you can come up with doesn't make sense until you realize that Nazi Germany must have been held by forces unknown. There is no way Germany could have done this all by itself, especially when you look at the financial side of the story. Who do you think loaned Hitler all that money? Do your own research and find out. The superior advanced Germany technology still puzzles me and many others to this day. Some claim they were 50 years ahead, perhaps even more. And it's all contributed to Germany's willingness to use the latest technology to their advantage. While all the other nations have failed to recognize the possibilities. Well, I have a hard time believing this. While Hitler was searching for occult artifacts all over the world, the most sacred of all crashed into the forest of Freiburg in 1936, almost on top of their heads. Opportunity came knocking, that's for sure. Now, let me take you back to Maria Ostrich and the Frail Society. Maria Ostrich was known to channel messages and acted as a medium on several occasions. She was a regular guest at Heinrich Himmler's castle and she took part in many channel sessions. She could even summon the spirits of deceased Nazi party members. They still advised their comrades from within their graves. Go figure. Maria Ostrich played an essential role in these sessions and she was destined to become one of the first to ever contact an extraterrestrial present in modern times. Now, Maria was sent for after the craft and its occupants were transported to Himmler's castle. She would have examined the diseased or even living pilots of the craft herself, perhaps laying her hands on their bodies. Or did she make contact by telepathy? Is it a coincidence that alien abductees often describe this form of communication as being the most common? It isn't hard to imagine that contact was made with the planet where these entities originated from. 
whether by physical contact or by channel sessions only. But one thing is for sure, Maria Ostrich received a lot of essential information during her channel sessions. Blueprints of exotic forms of technology were drawn on paper by Maria herself. The blueprints contain detailed information on how to create an anti-gravity engine. This allowed the Germans to create the most advanced flying crafts, such as the Haunabu and Frill crafts. They were in fact the first u boat built by humans, and possibly the source of the Foo Fighter legend. Allied bombers who were heading towards Germany were often accompanied by small orbs or strange lights. Small craft that were behaving like no other plane like they had ever witnessed. The Foo Fighters caused a huge amount of fear and confusion amongst Allied bomber personnel. Could these alleged Foo Fighters be in fact experimental German flying saucers? You know, sometimes I wonder the Germans were the first to sign the treaty with some alien race. We can only assume that we know what they had to offer. But what did Germany offer them in return? It is claimed that the Nazis were setting up a secret base for advanced weapon and flight experiments, as well as a place to escape should the war not go to plan. This was also detailed in newspapers of the time. In the Vierjahresplan, the four-year plan, promoting the Third Reich's plan to colonize the Neuschwabenland. And their plans also involved a person that would become synonymous for the Hollow Earth theory. In late 1938, Admiral Byrd visited Hamburg and was invited to participate in the 1938-1939 German Neuschwabenland Antarctic expedition by the Nazis. Byrd had a great knowledge of the Antarctic area. He had already been on several expeditions there previously. However, Byrd declined. The Nazi expedition discovered several ice-free regions with lakes and small signs of vegetation. The expedition geologist said this phenomenon was due to hot springs. This discovery led to Heinrich Himmler to hatch a bold plan to build a permanent base in Antarctica. That base was codenamed Station 211. Admiral Kardernitz announced its completion in 1943 by saying, The German submarine fleet is proud of having built for the Fuhrer in another part of the world a Shangri-La on land, an impregnable fortress. There are many stories around Station 211, one of which details a supposed treasure room which held the holy lands or the holy spear that pierced the side of Jesus Christ on the cross, as I mentioned earlier. Why Antarctica? During the Nazi expeditions to Tibet, they were given access to secret cave systems of the Tibetan monks that had not been seen for centuries. The Tibetans believed the arrival of the Nazis fulfilled their own prophecies that would usher in a new age of enlightenment. During the exploration of the caves by the Nazis, it is claimed that a secret volume of ancient texts from pre-flood times or even from Atlantis were found. These texts are supposed to have detailed where the opening to the hollow earth could be found and Hitler believed that an Aryan race dwelling there would help them win the war. It is claimed that after World War II, Adolf Hitler did not commit suicide in 1945, but fled to Argentina, then on to Station 211 in Antarctica. Numerous Nazi submarines went missing after World War II, and it's supposed that these were used to transport Hitler and others. Two submarines surfaced in Argentina, three months after the war. They were captured by the Allies and interrogated by the Secret Service. It is believed that these U-boats were the ones who transported Hitler and Eva Braun to Station 211. 
any possible evidence on both U-boats were missing. No name tags, no coordinates, no maps, nothing. But the Southern American Assembly of an Antarctic Research Expedition suggests that one of the crew members had failed to shut his mouth. Now, Admiral Byrd was sent to Antarctica. Publicly, it was just a research expedition. However, the amount of manpower sent was huge compared to the former Nazi Antarctic expedition. The massive Antarctic task force included 4,700 men, 13 ships and multiple aircraft. Just to give you an impression of the scale of this operation. Admiral Byrd comments in his press release of November 12, 1946, stated that the purposes of the operation are primarily of a military nature. That is to train naval personnel and to test ships, planes and equipment under frigid zone conditions. A major purpose of the expedition is to learn how the Navy's standard everyday equipment will perform under everyday conditions. Operation High Jump was designed to last eight months. However, they returned after two weeks, losing many heavy equipment and planes. And now we have to wonder, was Operation High Jump a cover to finish off Hitler? With the amount of manpower sand, it could be the case. But did they succeed to destroy the last Nazi stronghold? Judging by their early departure, I have a feeling they failed to wipe out the remaining Germans. On the way back from his disastrous mission, Byrd gave an interview to a prestigious newspaper in Chile on March 5, 1947. The article states, Admiral Byrd declared today that it was imperative for the United States to initiate defense measures against the possible invasion of the country by hostile aircraft operating from the polar regions. As regards the recently terminated expedition, Byrd said that the most important result of the observations and discoveries made is the current potential effect which they will have on the security of the United States. Well, this of course is the censored version. Others claim Byrd had actually won the United States government for an enemy that was able to fly from pole to pole in several minutes. And the most bizarre rumor I ever heard is when Admiral Byrd returned home, he was invited by the president himself. The president wanted to hear what happened to Byrd and his Navy fleet. Well, Admiral Byrd allegedly begged and pleaded the president to nuke the hell out of the polar region. He urged the president to drop several nuclear bombs on the alleged Nazi fortress. According to many deathbed confessions by expedition members, the fleet was approaching the entrance of base 211. All of a sudden, a fleet of UFO type crafts emerged from the icy waters and attacked the fleet with fierce aggression. Several ships were sunk in minutes. Many sailors lost their life that day. Witnesses also stated that German ground troops were defending the entrance of the base with strange weapons that fired sonic waves. The whole experience must have been terrifying to Byrd and his men. Finally, Byrd gave the order to retreat. He knew that if he would stay there any longer, his entire fleet would be destroyed. Well, now I will conclude this video with the most shocking rumor. At least the most shocking rumor I ever heard. You know, scientists always talk about how thin the ozone layer is at the North Pole, right? By measuring the thickness of the ozone layer at the poles, they can tell us in which condition the ozone layer is. Our polluting waves are the main reason for the thin ozone layer, according to scientists. But what if the ozone layer was already damaged? What if the Allies listened to Admiral Byrd's advice and decided to drop multiple atom bombs on the alleged base? Base 211. Imagine how long it would take for the ozone layer to recover. But hey, it's all rumors.